Do grad school committees tend to use the GPA to be able to weed out potential applicants? Find out today on this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up, Navigating Academia family? This is Dr. J. Phoenix Singh coming at you to be able to answer a valued viewer's question. Now, you guys know me. I sincerely appreciate you guys watching. Make sure to like this video, so smash that thumbs up button. Subscribe if you haven't already to the channel for this and other awesome videos about how to be able to navigate an academic career, get into grad school, get your dream postdoc, get tenure, and a million other things. And if you're interested in checking out even more about how to be able to publish your research articles in high impact journals, check out www.publicationacademy.com, the internet's largest how-to training website for how to be able to get published. Uh, over 120 hours of training, I provide the overwhelming majority of it. It is a company that I own, so I hope that you check it out because we just launched it literally less than a month ago and it is freaking awesome. So again, www.publicationacademy.com. So today's question comes from Boris. Boris, thank you so much for watching, mate. Boris is the man. He's always leaving very kind comments on the videos. So really appreciate you, mate. So I'm going to go ahead and read Boris's question and then answer it for you. All right, let's get into it. Hey, Dr. Singh, it's me again. Just going to say that I love your videos and that they're very informative for people who are already in academia and those who want to pursue their goals in that setting as well. Thanks, Boris. Here's my question. I'm an undergraduate student in my third year, which is a great time to be thinking about grad school, right? Usually undergrad lasts about four years. When that happens, it starts to get high stress time for people thinking about what's that next step for me in my career. So undergraduate student in his third year, majoring in English and literature. His current GPA is 3.27. I'm assuming Boris is out of a 4.0. Ideally, mate, if we can get that up to a 3.5 or higher, I would be thrilled, okay? I really love literature and envision myself studying the subject abroad for a master's in a place like the Netherlands, Germany, or Malta. If you decide to do that, Boris, which is awesome, man. I mean, you know me, you know, and did my undergraduate in the US and then both of my doctorates are international. First one's from Oxford, which obviously is in England. Second one is from University of Constance, which of course is in Germany. So completely understand that desire to be able to go abroad, to be able to get a degree. There's so many different reasons for that. If any of you watching have questions about getting international doctorates, please go ahead and post them down in the comments below. I do recommend that if you do that, Boris, in terms of doing the international national masters uh, to be able to do a one-year masters in Europe obviously it's very common to be able to have one-year masters sometimes you can find two-year masters as well but the one-year masters like an MA is very common uh, I myself when I went to Oxford was only supposed to go for a one-year MSc in psychiatry and ended up sticking around for the DPhil, so the PhD. Uh, but the one year is great because it kind of gets you that wanderlust, right? That wanderlust to be able to go abroad, to be able to make international contacts. It gives you one year to be able to explore a particular area of literature or linguistics that you're really passionate about. And it also gives you a runway to be able to prepare your application materials for graduate school. And of course, the acceptance rates for the preponderance of master's programs is going to be higher than those of PhD programs. So that is something logical. I'll tell you, Boris, that for me what happened was that I didn't get to study abroad as an undergrad. I finished undergrad in three years. I basically knew what I wanted to do even before I went to undergrad, really focused on getting all my coursework done, finishing up my standardized test, which was the GRE, to be able to get into my dream grad program, which I was lucky enough to be able to get into. This was a situation where for me, Boris, I was like, you know what? I didn't have the chance to study abroad because I was only you know there for three years in Boston at Tufts University where I did the undergrad why not go abroad for one year so I deferred my dream doctoral program to be able to go abroad of course I ended up staying abroad and that was the right decision for me at the end of the day for personal as well as what ended up being professional reasons uh, but I really support what you're doing Boris in terms of your game plan I like it very much okay so 
Uh, and then Boris also wants to do a PhD because he really wants to be a university lecturer and hierarchically make it to the top. That's great, right? And that's exactly what you want to be doing. So in some cases in the humanities, yes, it is the case where you can get your master's and then have quite a bit of practical experience and then still get a tenure track position. But that is not the norm. That is the exception to the rule. So you would either have to be particularly extraordinary or it would have to be a school that is just not that big of a name university or the program is not particularly well known or the pay is not particularly high so there's not a lot of applicants for you to be able to get those kinds of gigs. Uh, now I have uh, family members actually who only have the masters who are teaching at the community college level so that's also something that you could explore but of course the pay is commensurate so it's really not that high so just something to be able to take into consideration. All right so here we go. Uh, Boris says, I also have a first publication. Boris, very proud of you. That's awesome. Especially as an undergraduate, you should be very, very proud of yourself. Okay. Which is currently in the process of editing. Uh, so, and when we say editing, I'm assuming you mean like page proofs or something like this that has already been accepted for publication. If it's just something where you're writing it up right now, that's awesome. Make sure that you get that thing submitted and hopefully published by the time that you're actually doing your applications, okay? That's gonna make a much stronger case for you. You guys know me, my opinion on this is that publications, as well as personal connections, are the keys to the castle here for these doctoral program applications, okay? Uh, so, as the first one, two of my literature professors saw my presentations and gave me their compliments. Boris, I think that's awesome, but don't read anything into that, right? The thing that always gets people in trouble, I'll tell you, it got me in trouble, Boris, it gets everybody in trouble. So many people that I work with, they'll tell me that, you know, their undergraduate supervisor or somebody from their writing center uh, told them that they have a great personal statement and they have all this promise, it's gonna be easy for them to get into grad school or they're just like the ish, right? And that's what they're told. Just don't, it's very complimentary and, you know, take it to heart in terms of self-esteem, it's a good thing. Uh, don't take it any further than that, right? We don't want to have any kind of hubris or any sense that we're better off than other people just because we've gotten compliments from people at our institution or anybody other than the target supervisor we want to be working at, at the master's or the doctoral program, right? Which is often a difficult thing to hear, but it's also the best thing that I can advise, okay? So, uh, compliments, kind words. I networked with most of them through email, even, uh, even asked one of them for a paper of send an academic paper of theirs and it would pique my interest. I, I don't really understand what you're saying there. Um, da -da -da -da. But in terms of personal connections, right, the only personal connections that matter are with the target supervisor in terms of the master's program or the doctoral program. Now, if somebody at your university, though, one of these people that you've done a good job networking with, if they can serve as a middleman and make the introduction on your behalf of you to that target master's or doctoral supervisor, fantastic, right? That's what we want. That's a great position for you to be in, okay? But if it's just something where we're just connecting for the sake of connecting at the local level, that's not gonna help us, right, in terms of the master's or the doctoral applications. Yes, obviously, letters of recommendation, but if you don't have a really strong relationship with them on the magnitude of having worked very closely with them for at least six months to a year, we wanna kind of avoid them being a letter writer on our behalf, okay? Um, Boris says, most of my grades are comprised of A's, awesome, here it's a 10, and all of my literature grades, while nearly all of my linguistic grades are B's and one A. So what that would mean is that if you're applying again for an English literature master's or doctorate, you're gonna be better off than if you're applying for something that has a very strong linguistics component to it. It is what it is, that's just the situation. So, um, when I get accepted to a student university, uh, college, or faculty, does the grad school committee tend to weed out candidates by looking at their overall GPA, including linguistics, li literature, etc., or just grades that are required for your specialization? This is this is the ultimate question here, Boris. Okay, so and this is something relevant to all the all of the channel. Okay, so here's the idea: for the overwhelming preponderance of doctoral programs, specifically, to a lesser extent, master's programs, because usually fewer people are applying to them, unless it's something like an MBA, so a master's of business administration, because very rarely are people going and getting a master's in business administration and then like a doctorate in business ex administration. That's very rare unless you want to go and be a professor and even in that case the MBA will usually do if you have practical experience in this kind of stuff, all right? Uh, so in this case 
if you're applying to a doctoral program where usually there's a lot more applicants, right, compared to the masters, then yes, GPA is definitely something they're going to be taking a look at, right? And the reason they're going to be taking a look at, at it essentially is triage. In other words, exactly the wording that you use, which is to be able to weed people out. Let's say that you end up getting 500 applications. There's no way that that grad school committee is going to look at 500 applications. There's just, there's not enough time in the day, let alone in a month, let alone in a quarter, let alone in a year, right, to be able to come up with a uh, graduate kind of school class of individuals. It's not going to happen. So one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to take a look at, yes, the GPA, as well as any particular test scores that are required for that program. Uh, they'll certainly be taking a look at other things as well, but test scores, GPA, those are the keys to the castle, right? Now, some programs do care more about only the courses which uh, essentially comprise your major. So for example, in uh, psychology, for example, because this is my background, right? People will end up taking a look, these committees will take a look, yes, at overall GPA as well as your psych GPA. In other words, the GPA of only your psych major classes. So they will take a look at both of those. If there's a massive discrepancy between them, so let's say you've got like a 3.0 overall and like a 3.9 in terms of your psych GPA for whatever reason, that would help you out quite a bit, but you would also need to make sure in something like your personal statement, certainly would be brought up during the interviews. If I was interviewing you, it would come up, right? So just make sure if nothing else you have an answer prepped for that if there's that large of a discrepancy. So for Boris, it seems like for you mate, it's it not particularly, I mean you got a 3.27 overall, but it sounds like when it comes to just your major in terms of English literature, it's closer to a 4.0, which is fantastic. But I would love again, if you can take that overall GPA, get it above a 3.5, I would be thrilled. Most important thing, take a look, at if you can find the median GPA, right, for your target program, make sure it's at or above that. Why? Because some schools, that median GPA is going to be way higher. In some cases, it's going to be way lower. It just depends on the program. And if you can get that information for the last several years, fantastic, right? This information, if you can measure it, you can manage it. And if you get that information, it's going to help you out a ton, okay? Uh, so, very good. Specializations. Okay, great. So, Boris, I think that covers everything. So, long story short, yes, absolutely, this is going to be used to be able to weed people out. But it's not going to be used to be able to get people in. What do I mean by that? If you have everything uh, that everybody could ever want in terms of a uh, graduate student and you got a 4.0 GPA versus a 3.9 GPA, the, the 4.0 GPA individual is not going to have some, you know, huge, huge, uh, you know, thing to lord over you compared to the 3.9. This is when things like the personal connections and the publications truly make all the difference. But you got to get over the hump. So yes, there's the GPA hump and yes, there's the test score hump, right? Those, it's almost like getting over a, a particular obstacle, a particular hurdle. Once you're over them, put those in the ba on the back burner, put those, uh, you know, aside and don't even think about them anymore because then we're going to be getting on to the things that honestly really matter in terms of getting you into grad school. Right? So for example, in my field of psych, you'll hear me say in other videos, never let anybody tell you that just because you've got an amazing GPA, an amazing set of test scores, three phenomenal letters of recommendation, research experience and clinical experience, that you're going to get into a clinical program. All five of those things are required, but because everybody knows those five things, everybody's got them. So that makes you totally and utterly average if you have all of those things, right? And so this is what I specialize in as a consultant is all the people who work with me, they say, okay, I've got those things or maybe one of these is already a weakness. I still want to get into one of these top doctoral programs or master's programs. What can I do, Dr. Singh, to be able to do that? And there are several different things that you need to be able to get into those programs. And anybody who wants to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, I will give you that website in a second. You can contact me, book a session, we'll go through it, and we'll figure out a customized plan for you. All right, guys, signing off for the day. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be sure to smash that like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already for more great content like this. In addition, if you want to get in touch with me and book a one-on-one -on -one session, all of my rate information and such is available down here at the website below. And remember to check out Publication Academy as well at www.publicationacademy.com. Looking forward to hearing from you guys soon. Talk to you later. Peace.
Thank you so much for stopping by everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.